So the goal of this game is to control Greek culture, which is measured on this circle here encompassing the map. This is called the culture wheel, and it is made up of uh, 60 spaces that you can see right here. One, two, three. Some of them have special symbols like this. Those indicate cultural advantages. At the beginning of the game, each player is going to have two cultural advantages, which are going to help them in some way throughout the game. But the important thing are these pieces, which you see on the culture wheel. Um, these are called culture tokens. There are six culture tokens on the culture wheel. Each culture token has two colors. This one, for example, yellow and red indicating that it is shared by the Argive player and the Spartan player. Argive is yellow, Sparta is red. Each player is going to have two of these culture tokens that they share with somebody else. And the culture tokens indicate the borders between the cultural influence of those two players. At the beginning of the game, each player controls ten shares of the Greek culture. And throughout the game, your goal is going to be move to move your culture tokens so that you can expand the amount of influence that you have at the expense of one of your neighbors. An interesting part of this game is that each player has two neighbors, culturally speaking. Geographically, you can be neighbors with anybody, but you're going to have two cultural neighbors, and each time you expand your cultural influence, it's going to be at the expense of another player. At the end of the game, we're going to count to see who has the most uh, cultural influence, and the way that we're going to measure that is by whose culture tokens are furthest away from each other, indicating that they have dominated the greatest portion of Greek culture. So, the winner of this game may or may not be the player who is the most militarily successful. The winner of this game may or may not be the player who is the most economically successful. But the winner of this game certainly will be the person who is the most culturally successful. Let's talk about how this game ends so that you know um, what kind of timing you should be counting on for uh, planning your cultural domination. The game ends conceptually when ancient Greek culture has more or less been established um, to be what we know it as today. And that happens when all of these tokens have been taken by all the various players. These tokens are schools. They represent schools of thought like Stoicism um, and also physical academies like Plato's Academy. And there are 20 of them. And once all 20 schools have been established by different players, the game is over. Um, or to be more precise, the game ends at the end of that round. So as soon as you see a player establish the last, the 20th school, then you know that the game will be ending at the end of that round. And so you'd better start expanding your cultural influence quickly, because at the end of that round, once the game is over, then we're going to count to see whose culture tokens are further apart. In other words, who has expanded their cultural influence more than any other player. And that is who is going to win the game. So this is the most common way for the game to end. There are two exceptions, two, two ways to end the game earlier, sooner than all schools have been established. And the first of those exceptions is if you are successful in eliminating all other players. This is going to be extremely difficult because to eliminate a player, you have to destroy all of their cities. So if, for example, the Persian player was successful in destroying all the other players' cities in the game, then they would all be eliminated and he would be the last man standing, and therefore he would de facto win the game immediately. If all other players are eliminated, you win the game. This is the only way to militarily win the game, and it will be extremely rare. This will, this will almost never happen. It is possible that a player or two players might be eliminated from the game, but to eliminate everybody is going to be extremely difficult. The other way that you can end the game prematurely is if one player is successful in dominating the entire culture wheel by expanding their culture tokens all the way around the map, like this. If you move all your culture tokens all the way around so that you control all 60 spaces on the culture wheel, then you immediately win the game. Now that might look even more difficult than eliminating the players militarily, but once I get to the rules on how to expand culture, then you'll see that that is technically possible. It might happen. It will also be very rare, but it could happen. And in the case that somebody would, would uh, control 100% of Greek culture, then the game will end immediately. So, uh, three ways to end the game. Military domination, cultural domination, or uh, most likely the game will end when all uh, 20 schools have been established, and at that point you're going to count up to see who has the most cultural influence, and that player will win the game. Um, of course, the game ends at the end of the round when the 20th school has been established. So, uh, that's how you win the game, that's how the game ends. Let's talk about what the structure of the game is. Each game is going to consist of several rounds, and each round is going to consist of an unknown number of turns. The number of turns simply depends on how much power do the different players have. In other words, how, many, uh, how much freedom do they have to um, use the different strengths of their empire to expand. Um, and, and, and we'll see what all the different things that you can do on your turn are. Um, but each round, and this is important, each round is going to begin with income. So before you even play 
any action before you even take a single turn on a round, you get coins, which are going to be very important for performing the actions on your turn uh, later on in, in the round. Okay, so each round begins with income. And the rules for income are always the same and they're very simple. Count up how many cities you have and how many trade routes you have and gain one coin for each. If I have three cities and two trade routes, I gain five coins. This is what a trade route looks like. And this is what a city looks like. This is what a city looks like on the back. So count up your cities and count up your trade routes and then gain one coin for each. Again, if I have four cities and one trade route, I gain five coins at the beginning of each round. Everybody does this simultaneously, that should be very quick, and we move on to the action phase. And this is going to take up about 98% of the game. Almost everything that you do, you're going to do on your action phase, um, and the action phase will always begin with the Persian player. Persia always begins every single round. This is extremely important to remember. And per the Persian player is going to be able to perform one action on their turn. And after they perform that action, and I'll explain what that might look like in a second, but after they perform that action, then it's the Spartans player. And we go clockwise around the culture wheel. So Persia, Sparta, Argos, Athens, Corinth, Thebes, and then we continue. Persia, Sparta, Argos, Athens, until one player has performed all of the different actions that they can, and so they, on their turn, when they can't perform any more actions, or maybe they just don't want to perform any more actions, they say, I'm ending actions. And then everybody continues without them. Until everyone has ended actions, and nobody else, nobody has anything left to do, or nobody wants to do anything. And so the round is over, and we prepare for the next round, we set up for the next round, we do income, and we go again, starting the action phase again with the Persian player, and moving clockwise around the circle. That is how the structure of the game is going to look. We're going to be uh, doing income, and then everybody gets to perform a bunch of actions, and then when everybody has performed all the actions that they want to perform, then the round is over, and we do income again. And so, at some round later on, in the game, the final school will be established, and so everybody will get to be able to play the rest of the turns that are interesting to them that round, and then everybody will basically use up all of their different options, and that round will end, and so will the game. So that's how you play Hellas. The question is, what can you do on your turn? What are the different kinds of actions that you can perform? There are two kinds of actions in this game. There are citizen actions, and there are city actions. Basically, on your turn, what you're doing is you're calling on a portion of the population of your empire to help you expand your power, either militarily or economically or culturally. And either you're going to be calling upon a large portion of your population, like an entire city, to provide you with soldiers or to establish a trade route or something big like that, or you are going to call on a very specific skilled individual, a, a very specific citizen who has a, an important skill set, which is going to help you expand your empire in another way. So there are two types of actions that you can perform on your turn. You can activate a city or you can activate a citizen to help you in the way that you want. And the rest of this tutorial is going to be very simple. First I'm going to talk about what cities do, then I'm going to talk about what citizens do, and then I'm going to talk about uh, combat, and then I'll just give a summary of all the different rules that I have described in this game. So let's talk about cities. At the beginning of the game, each player starts with one city card, which again looks like this. This is what it looks like at the back. It says activated city, and this is what it looks like in the front. The reason it says activated city is because when you activate a city on your turn, you say, I'm going to perform a city action, you flip it, so that you know that you can't perform that action again that turn. You can only use each card, each city, and each citizen once per round. Um, so that's what a city looks like. And it's important to know that each city has to have a corresponding figure somewhere on the map. Um, and so you can see that Athens has one city, and that city is right here. They have a city card, which I just showed you, but that city card has a corresponding figure right here in Athens. Notice that um, the Argive player has two cities, one in Argos, one in Miletus. There's, historically, they had no connection, um, but during the gameplay, you might be able to see why I made this decision to, to form this as a single, um, to make this a single faction. Um, and so, but they have two city cards as well as two city figures, and the same goes for Persia. Um, now, as far as setup goes, this is important. Each player starts with two ci uh, citizens. They're random citizens, and they can appoint them before the game begins into different positions. I'll talk about that later. But just so you know, the Persian player and the Argive player only start with one citizen at the beginning of the game because they get two cities, which is a large advantage. Um, and so they have a slight disadvantage in that they have only one random citizen at the beginning of the game. All right, but let's talk about cities. What do you do with a city? Well, when you activate a city on your turn, um, then, as I said, you're calling on a large portion of your population to perform a specific task. And that task is going to be um, basically uh, gaining one of these cards over here. Basically, you can call on your city to produce a military unit, for example. 
right, a group of soldiers that are going to fight for you, and you put them in your army. Or you can have them establish a trade route. Some of these are going to be costing you money, and some of them are going to be free. So um, most of the time, when you activate a city, that's, that's precisely what you're going to be doing. You're going to be gaining one card from the stock over here. And so now I'm going to explain exactly what kinds of interesting things there are in the stock that you can obtain with your city. First, let's talk about the military units. On your turn, you may flip one of your city cards, like for example, if I'm Athens, then I flip the card so that everybody can see that I've activated it. And I say, I'm going to be gaining a military unit. If you look at the corner of the card, you can see that if you look at the yellow, I'm having trouble focusing there, you can see um, this number in the yellow field is zero. That means it, it costs zero because it's either volunteers or conscript, conscripts. In either case, I'm not paying for it. Um, and as soon as I activate my city to obtain a military unit for free, then I place it in one of my armies or I place it in one of my navies. Now, um, if you look at your city tableau, which each player begins with, starts the game with, and up at the top you can see um, armies, and later they're gonna, those armies are going to be led by generals. And, and down below you can see navies. And so I'm going to want to take that military unit and either put him um, down here in my first navy, my second navy, or my third navy, or I'm going to put him in one of my three armies. And so I know exactly um, who will be leading him. Once I've appointed a general or an admiral to that navy or that army, um, then, then all of a sudden that, that military unit becomes possibly useful in a future battle. So that's the first thing that you can do with your city. You can use your city to gain one of these cards over here, um, namely a military unit, which you can do for free. All you have to do to get a military unit is on your turn, activate one of your cities. Next, um, you can similarly use uh, your city, flip it on your turn, activate it on your turn, to build a wall. This is what a wall looks like, and this is an old version of the card. I'm really having trouble focusing right now. This is an old version of the card, and it says that the wall costs two, but that's not true. Um, a wall actually costs one, so you're going to just have to ignore that. I'm sorry about that mistake. But a, call, a wall costs one. That means in order to gain a wall, you have to flip a city on your turn and spend one coin. And then you get the wall. And the wall, similarly to a military unit, is going to help you in combat later on in the game. And now it's important to notice one detail on the card of a wall, which I'll show you as soon as it focuses. This is a little bit frustrating. There we go. Right here, this symbol right here, it's the symbol of a pawn. And whenever you see that symbol, it tells you that that card has a corresponding figure somewhere on the map. A citizen, I mean a city, has that symbol. Um, and the figure that tells you where your wall is, is just a simple coin. You put that coin under the city that you want your wall to be surrounding, and everybody knows now that that is a more fortified city and it will be more difficult to conquer militarily later on. So, um, you can use your city to gain a military unit for free, or you can spend one coin to build a wall. Later, you'll see that walls and military units have the same combat value, um, but they, they enter into combat under different circumstances, because military units are led by generals and admirals, and walls surround cities and help defend cities. Um, oh, next, let's talk about cities. This is an interesting aspect of the game, and that is that the way that you gain more cities is by activating your city an existing city on your turn. So the way that you build new cities in this game is by activating your existing cities, just like as if you were obtaining a military unit or a wall. Um, now the interesting thing, the important thing is here, when you gain a city, you're going to gain it as if it's already been activated. So when you build a city on your turn, um, then you can't activate that city. You have to wait until the next round to be able to activate the city. Um, so when you buy it, you buy it with this side forward, and again, we're gonna have to wait for the camera to focus. There we go. So you're gonna gain it as if activated, but then later, next round, you're gonna flip it over and you're gonna be able to use it. But let's talk about these symbols that we have on the city card. Oh, also, the very important, notice that a city costs six coins. So it's gonna be pretty difficult to be able to actually buy a city. Um, but let's talk about the, the symbols that we have here. So first we've got this gray symbol, which is a pawn again. That means that the city has to have a corresponding um, piece on the board. And in one second, I'm going to tell you what the rules are for building cities. Because you can't just build a city 
if um, if you have nowhere to build it. You have to have a place on the map where you can actually place that corresponding figure. So I'll talk about the rules for that in just one second. Next, if you look here, this is supposed to be a symbol for a coin, um, and that tells you that this is a card that generates income. We already know that. Cities and trade routes generate income. And then this last sim symbol, which is very difficult to see, is uh, it's, it's a symbol of a hand playing a card, and that tells you that this is one of the two kinds of cards in the game that can perform actions. The other type of card that can perform actions are citizens, so we already knew that as well. These symbols tell you all of the abilities that this card has right here. The, its abilities are, it has a uh, presence on the map, it generates income, and you can use it to perform actions. And the way that you perform that action is exactly what I'm describing right now. Um, and um, in other words, the, the kind of action that you perform with a, with a city is, is gaining one of these cards from the stock right here, expanding your empire in some way. Um, now let's talk about where you can build cities. Because you can't just get a city card every time you have six coins and a free city to activate on your turn. It's not quite that simple. You can only build a city on a land territory adjacent to one of your existing cities or one of your existing trade routes. A trade route, um, there's a card for a trade route, but the card also has a, a figure like this, which is a ship. So if you look at, if you imagine that you're the Argive player right now, you're yellow, then there are a couple of places where you can build a city. Um, adjacent, it has to be a land territory adjacent to one of your existing cities or one of your existing trade routes. So this would be a great place to build a city. You could also build a city here. You could build a city here. You could even build a city here. This trade route greatly expands your options for where you can build cities. You could even build a city right here on the island of Crete. So um, you're not always going to have a place to build a city in this game. Um, and so when you do have a place to build a city and you do have enough money, six coins, um, in order to build a city, then you're probably going to want to do it because having cities is extremely important for this game. So this card um, is going to count as two hit cards right here. You can see two hit symbols. So um, what, you, what happens when you purchase military tradition with one of your cities is you make your battle deck more powerful, therefore increasing the strength of actually all of um, your fighting units. And, and the way that that happens is that you've basically increased the probability that when you're in combat you're going to draw the right card from that deck. And not only that, but the right card, uh, I mean, if, if you pull the military tradition card from your battle deck while you're fighting, it's going to count as two hits, which is more powerful than any card that you start out with in your battle deck. So uh, in this game it's going to be good to have a kind of balance between the size of your army and also the quality of your army. And the way that you improve the quality of your army is by purchasing military tradition right here for five coins when you activate a city. Now the last card that you can obtain with your city is the citizen card. Uh, basically you're calling on one of your cities to produce a skilled individual who will dedicate their um, talents to your empire. Right here um, you can see the back of a um, uh, citizen. It costs three. This is an activated citizen just like you have an activated city because when you activate your citizen you, you flip it over. Um, and, and just like a city, when you obtain this card, then you obtain it as if it has already been activated. You can't use it until the next round. On the other side of the card, you have what it looks like when it's unactivated, when it's ready to be used. And you can see that it still costs three. That's one thing. And then you can also see the symbol, just like with uh, uh, cities, which tells you that this is a card that you can play as an action. And then very interesting here is uh, are the statistics of the particular citizen. As soon as you gain your citizen, then you're going to appoint him um, to your city tableau. Now, the most important function of your city tableau is that it organizes your citizens, your city citizens and, um, and tells you what each citizen that you've obtained is going to be doing for the rest of the game. As soon as you purchase this citizen by flipping a city on your turn and paying three coins, you appoint him to one of these positions. For example, um, you can make him a demagogue, or you can make him or her a philosopher, or an, an admiral, a statesman, an artist, or a general. So there are uh, six functions that the, your citizen can have, and as soon as you purchase your citizen, then you're going to appoint your citizen depending on what that citizen's skills are. And by the way, the lower numbers are, are better. So this citizen named Aridi is going to be a better, she has more wisdom and more zeal than she does leadership. Um, so you're going to want to keep that in mind when you appoint her. Another very important detail to note is that you can either purchase a random citizen from the deck here, or you can purchase one of these three citizens 
which is revealed. And if you purchase one of those citizens, then you immediately place a citizen from the deck into those three space, one of those three spaces. Um, and, and so the reason why you would purchase one of these citizens is because you want to know what you're getting before you purchase it. But there are going to be points in the game um, when you actually don't really care what kind of citizen you get. You just know that you want one of them um, and that you'll be able to use him somehow. And so maybe uh, you would prefer to get a citizen, a random citizen, than one of the three citizens that you see laid out here. There should be 48 citizens in the game, and once they've run out, then you cannot purchase citizens any longer. Um, by the way, there's also a similar element with trade routes and with cities, because there's a limited amount of territories on the board. You can't have more than one city or more than one trade route in a single territory on the board. That's an important note. So, um, most of the time, 90% of the time, when you activate a city, you are going to be gaining one of these cards. It's also important to note that this is the only way that you can get, gain these cards, um, other than combat. You can, you can capture things in combat, but, but other than that, the only way that you can ever get a card um, from the stock is by activating your cities. Cities are extremely important, um, but it's interesting that this isn't all that they can do. There are two abilities that I haven't mentioned yet that are very powerful um, that you're going to be using your cities to do. And, and those two abilities are you can use your city to collect taxes. And what that means is that on your turn, when you activate your city, if none of these cards are interesting to you, uh, but you're running low on cash, you can, instead of a card, gain a single coin. And that is apart from the income generation that your city provides automatically at the beginning, beginning of each round. So, um, at the beginning of each round, you're going to gain one coin for each city that you have, as well as one coin for each trade route that you have, but then later on, you can actually activate one of your cities and say, I'm activating this city to collect taxes and just gain a coin that way as well. So each, each city can be generating up to two coins every round which is extremely powerful. Usually it will be better to gain cards than coins with your city, because as I said, the only way that you can get cards is by using your cities, but there are other ways to get coins in the game than by activating cities. Uh, so collecting taxes is one thing that you might want to do um, sometimes, but not often. And then the last thing that you can do with a city is attack your enemies. This is an interesting, maybe slightly counterintuitive aspect of the game, um, but it's important to understand that in ancient Greece, um, when you declared war, it was not just a military decision, it was a political decision, and it was also a bureaucratic event. You had to pass it through the assembly, or you had to um, convince the ephods to let you... Wait, am I saying that right? In any case, you, whether it was an oligarchy or a dem democracy, you had to pass the motion of attacking your enemy. Um, and also, it, was, it, it required lots of uh, preparation and transportation. And so in this game, when you want to declare combat, a battle with somebody else, you have to activate one of your cities on your turn by flipping, flipping it over and saying, I am attacking you in this territory which we share. For example, right here. Sparta shares this territory with Argos, and so Sparta can activate a city on, on their turn, flip it over, and say, I'm attacking you here. Attacking is free. Collecting taxes is, of course, also free. Um, gaining military units is free, but the other things that you can do with a city are paid because all of the other cards are, um, none of the other cards are free. Now the last thing that I want to say about cities uh, is, before we talk about citizens and then we're going to talk about combat, is um, I need to tell you a little bit about cultural advantages. So I mentioned those earlier on. Um, there are cultural advantages on the culture wheel, and each player at the beginning of the game um, has two cultural advantages. Cultural advantages are discounts on the cards that you can purchase from the, uh, from the stock. And here you can see that Athens, for example, begins with these two cultural advantages. They begin with uh, two discounts on military tradition, one discount off of citizens and one discount off of trade routes. That means that for them, military tradition doesn't cost five, but it costs three. Citizens don't cost three, but they cost two. And trade routes don't cost three, but they cost two. And each faction has a different set of cultural advantages. Um, the, there's only one cultural advantage that doesn't function precisely in that way that I just explained, that it's a discount off of a card. And I'll explain that one later when I'm, exp when I'm describing combat. But, for now, all you need to know is that um, each, the, the price of each card is listed uh, in the upper right corner, but you might have a cultural discount off of a particular card. Okay, so that's all that there is for cities. Let's talk about what you can do with your citizens. On your turn, you can either flip one of your cities or you can flip one of your citi ci uh, citizens. When you flip a city, you have lots of different options. There are many different things that you can do because there are many different cards that you can purchase, or you could attack somebody, or you could collect taxes. 
city, uh, citizens are a little bit different because citizens, um, <clears throat> once they're appointed to a particular position, they have a very specific role that they play. Um, there are six types of citizens, which I named earlier. There are demagogues, philosophers, admirals, statesmen, artists, and generals. You can have up to three of each type. You can't have more than that, though. So even demagogues, philosophers, you can't have more than three of each. That means you can have a total of 18 citizens, no, not more. Each um, citizen type has two possible actions that they can perform. They have two abilities. So as I said, with, with a city, there are lots of different things that you can do each round. But with a citizen, there are two things that that particular citizen can do each round. And if you look right here, for example, at the demagogues, then you can see that they have these two abilities, one ability here and one ability here. Each citizen has a free ability, like this one right here, which you can see has a cost of zero. And each citizen has a paid ability, a special ability, that I'll describe in a second. But first let's talk about what are the free abilities that each citizen card is going to have. If you have appointed your citizen as a demagogue, then he will have the free ability to generate a single coin, which is really powerful. That means that, let's imagine, let's take a look at Aristophanes. Let's imagine that Aristophanes is a demagogue. It's not an artist, but a demagogue. Then I can, on my turn, instead of flipping a city, flip Aristophanes. Now he's activated. And I say, I'm using this demagogue's free ability to gain a coin, just as if I was collecting taxes with a city. So that is the demagogue's free ability. Statesmen share this ability. For free, you can flip a statesman like this and say, I'm using the free ability and I'm gaining a coin. So demagogues and statesmen have the same free ability. In reality, they're probably using very different methods to gain coins for your empire. But in the game, the effect is exactly the same. You activate your statesman or your demagogue for free and gain a coin. Let's talk about philosophers and artists. They also share a free ability. Philosophers share this ability, which is that you can move one of your culture tokens one space. And as you know, that is exactly how you win the game. So if I'm the archive player, I can flip Aristophanes, I can flip Aristophanes the artist, activate him, say I'm using his free ability, and I can move one of my culture tokens one space. And voila, I now have 11 spaces on the culture wheel, meaning I have the most cultural influence and I will probably win the game at that point. So moving one culture, uh, moving your culture token one space might not look like a big, a big deal in the big picture, but if you have a philosopher or an artist at the beginning of the game and you activate him for free every single round, then by the end of the game, that's going to count up and it might just tilt the scales enough for you to win the game. It's also a good way of stealing cultural advantages from other players. Because if you can move your culture token into the symbol that is giving them their cultural advantage, then you can actually steal it from them. And at this point, it's important to know that the player whose color is on top is the player who controls the space that the culture token is on. So if I was the Argive player, then um, I would have to move uh, my culture, this culture token that I share with Athens past this symbol right here to be able to steal that cultural advantage, which is the advantage that gives Athens a discount off of military tradition and trade routes. So moving cultural tokens is extremely useful, and of course it's extremely important because that's how you win the game. But it's just one space. Lastly, let's talk about generals and admirals. They also share a free ability. Admirals have a free ability of movement, and you can see that there are two colors there. It's a, it's a blue field with a brown part. There are two colors there, blue and a little bit of brown. And that tells you that your admiral, and this is what an admiral looks like in this game, and your admiral can move one space either on sea or also on land if um, you occupy that land space with a general or with a city. So uh, on my turn, I can, I can flip, say, Dion the Admiral, I flip that card, and then I get to move the, his piece one space um, to a neighboring sea territory, or I could also move him into Argos. Um, it's important to know that my Admiral and all of his military units that are in that corresponding army um, are gonna be able to fight in a sea territory, but they can't fight on land. And so when you move an admiral on land, then you're putting him at risk of being destroyed by, say, this, this Spartan general right here, which is very capable of fighting on land. Um, so that's a risk that you're gonna take. Now, generals uh, basically have the same ability, but it's, it's, it's kind of the flip side. Um, it's a mostly brown 
uh, symbol with a blue part, and that tells you that generals can move on land. Say if I have an, an Argive general right there, I can move him one space on land, or I can make, move him one space on sea if I have an admiral there or a trade route there. Um, so admirals and, and generals can move on land and on sea, but in order to move on the territory that's not their um, that's not their home turf, they have to you, you have to have um, presence in that territory that can support your general, for example, venturing out to sea or your admiral coming back to dock on land. Okay, so I'm going to wrap up this tutorial by talking about what are the paid special abilities of each citizen, and, uh, and then we're going to talk about combat, and that's going to be all. Uh, before I give a summary of all the different things that you're going to be doing in this game. So, uh, first, <clears throat> let's talk about um, the demigod's special ability. Uh, you can see that here. If on your turn you flip your demagogue citizen, and, and instead of using his free ability, you choose to use his demagogue special ability, uh, then you have to pay a price which is equal to whatever his zeal is. So it's good to have skillful citizens in the right place because that will make sure that your special abilities are going to be a lot more cost effective. For example, if Aristophanes was your demagogue, then it would only cost one coin to use his special ability. But if Dion were your demagogue, then it would cost three coins to use that ability, um, making Dion a much, much less effective demagogue. But what does this special ability do? On your turn, you flip your citizen, which is a demagogue, and you say, I'm not using his free ability, I'm using his paid ability. What does it do? Well, you can see by the symbol, it says that you can perform three actions immediately. Normally on your turn, you can only perform one action. You flip one of your cities and you get a military unit, or you flip your statesman and you get a coin. But if on your turn, you flip your demagogue and say you're using your special ability, then immediately you get to do three things before the next player plays their turn. So, for example, I could flip my demagogue, pay one coin or pay two coins, depending on the skill level of the demagogue, whatever their zeal is. Then I can move the demagogue um, one, uh, I'm sorry, I get, to, I get three, option, uh, three actions. So for example, one of the actions could be flipping my general to use his free ability and move him one, one space, for example, here. And then I still have two more actions that I can perform immediately before the next person's turn. So I flipped one of my city cards, for example, and I say, um, I'm attacking you there. I'm using the city card to initiate combat right there in this territory that I, I share with Sparta. Um, the, so the purpose of a demagogue is to do things quickly. Normally in this game, everything takes quite a long time. On one turn, you move your general. And then you have to wait for everybody else to make their move before you can flip your city to actually fight the guy in that territory. Um, demagogues help speed that process up so that you can attack your enemy when they least uh, suspect it. Or um, conversely, let's say uh, Sparta moves into this territory on their turn. And then on my turn, I am panicking because I know that he's going to attack me. I could use a demagogue to flip three cities, if I had three cities, right now Argos only has two, but maybe I could use those two cities to get military units or to improve my military tradition so that I can defend myself. You could also use your demagogue to activate your artists and your philosophers so that you can capture important cultural advantages on time or so that you can quickly expand your cultural influence or establish academies and schools or whatever it is that you need to do to be able to have maximum uh, cultural influence by the end of the game, for example. Or maybe you could use your demagogue so that you can, um, in, so that you can use, uh, so that you can expand your cultural influence faster. So that, for example, you could uh, control, dominate the entire Greek culture, um, and, and therefore trigger a, a game ending prematurely um, by controlling all sixty spaces on the culture wheel. So demagogues help speed things up. Uh, but it's important to understand that in order to utilize the demagogue, you have to have uh, free. Uh, cards that uh, citizen and city cards that haven't been activated yet. Um, you can't use a demagogue to do whatever you want. You have to use the materials, um, the action cards that are available to you um, that have not yet been activated, and then you do activate them when uh, on that turn. Um, so demagogues speed things up, and there's actually a disadvantage uh, to using your demagogue, and that is that you're going to be ending that round sooner than everybody else, and everybody will know what you have done, and then they're going to be able to respond to that later on in the round. You're just going to have to wait until the beginning of the next round because you've activated all of your cards prematurely. 
Okay, so that's a demagogue. Demagogues uh, can generate coin every round, or they can speed the game up. Let's talk about statesmen. Statesmen are kind of the opposite of demagogues. They, for free, they can generate coins just like demagogues, um, but their paid ability is a lot more expensive because it's going to require the cost of that um, character's leadership plus wisdom. So, Dion is going to cost four to activate um, if, if he's a statesman to activate his special ability because his leadership plus zeal, I mean, sorry, his leadership plus wisdom is four. If he wanted to use um, Aristophanes as a statesman, then he would actually cost six. He would be a terrible statesman. Um, and uh, so the lowest amount that you're going to be able to spend to activate a statesman's special ability is three. Pericles, for example, is a great statesman. Um, Dion is quite a good statesman, but he's not the best. So it depends on the, the skill level of your uh, statesman, but you pay that price in coins, and then you get this very, very powerful ability, and that is that you get to flip three activated cities. So uh, during the game, you have been activating cities every round, and you've used them all up. Let's say you've got three cities. If, for example, I'm still the Argive player, let's say I also have a city in Laconia right here. So, um, I've got three cities, but I've used them all up to build trade routes and military units and so on, but I still want to, I want to do even more. Well, I could activate my statesman and say, I'm not using his free ability, I'm using his special ability. I pay four coins, which is quite a lot of money, but then I get to flip those three cities that I had activated before, effectively doubling the amount of expansion that I can do that round, get, provided that I have enough income to be able to actually do anything useful with that. But this, this is a great way to, for example, grow my army, or I can even use one of those cities later on, say next, next turn, I could use that city to gain a coin if maybe I'm missing the coin that I need to be able to do exactly what, I, what it was that I wanted. Um, but using statesmen can be extremely useful for um, doubling the, the effectivity of your, of your cities. Um, it's kind of the opposite of demagogues because demagogues speed things up, but statesmen for coin slow things down. So if you use your statesmen, then likely you're going to be the last person performing actions that round because you're going to have the most actions to perform, which is a great thing, but it costs money. Okay, next let's talk about um, generals and admirals. First we can talk about admirals. Admiral's special ability costs leadership. Just one, just leadership. So Aristophanes would be a terrible, terrible admiral. He would cost four to use his special ability. Dion wouldn't be the worst admiral because he would cost two to use that special ability. Um, now what that special ability does is that you get to move that admiral, his figure, two spaces, but only on water. So normally when you use an admiral's free ability, you can move on land, provided that you have a dock there. But if you use this um, paid ability, then you spend a coin, or you spend two coins, to say, here's my admiral, to move him up to two spaces on water uh, territory. So for example, I can go from here, one, two. Or if I already was starting here, then I could move one, two. And that could get me almost halfway across the map. If I was here, I could also go one, two, and get all the way to the Levantine Sea um, from the Mediterranean. And, and so this is an extremely powerful ability because the, the sea territories are so large, uh, there are just so many different options um, for moving on, on the sea. Uh, especially if you're using the special ability that allows you to move too. But just remember, you can't use this, spe this special ability to move through land territories. It's very similar for generals. Uh, if you look at the general's special ability, they are more expensive. Um, using a general's more special ability requires leadership and zeal. So um, Dion, for example, would not be a particularly good general. He would cost five to activate his special ability. Aristophanes would be an equally bad general, also costing five. We would need somebody more like, well, oh wow, it looks like there are no good generals here. If somebody wanted to get a good general, um, there's Tissaphernes, Zarathustra, and Anaxagoras. None of them are good generals. So if somebody wanted a good general, they would have to get a new one. Oh, look, this is a brilliant general, Leonidas, on the top of the deck. I just pulled this random card. And he is a general with two leadership and one zeal, so he would cost three to use his special ability. Um, and what does this special ability do? Well, first of all, when generals move this quickly across land, um, it is quite the cultural a spectacle. It is something that generates myths and legends. And so the first thing that you do is you move one of your culture tokens to spaces. Uh, that's very powerful. Um, and also you get to move your general piece to spaces. Now that is actually a lot more powerful than it may seem. If, for example, um, I am the, uh, say I'm the Spartan player and I have my Spartan here in the isthmus, then I could move him two spaces. 
to Attica and then to Athens, and all of a sudden I'm in the Athenian capital. Or I can move him from the Isthmus, two spaces, to Boeotia, and then to Thebes, which is also extremely powerful. Or I can move him to the Isthmus, uh, from the Isthmus to Achaea, and then to Argos, and be in the Argive capital. So, um, moving two spaces on land can be extremely important and powerful, especially if you have an enemy who's building defenses on the edge of uh, his territory, trying to defend against you, you can just hop over that. Um, you can walk, uh, waltz right through his general and, and, uh, and enter his territory from the back door. But that is quite an expensive move, it's going to cost three or four coins. Now let's talk about philosophers and artists. Activating a philosopher is going to cost whatever that philosopher's wisdom is. That's going to probably be one or two coins. Um, both Dion and Aristophanes would cost two. Leonidas would be a terrible philosopher. Don't appoint him as a philosopher. Um, when you flip your citizen, who is a philosopher, and announce that you are using a special ability, you pay one or two coins, depending on his skill level, and what do you receive? Well, you receive one school. You receive a school, which is looks like this. Now remember, once 20 of these have been established, the game is over. So, only um, philosophers will only use their special ability at the most 20 times during a game, because after the, uh, a philosopher has been activated for the 20th time, then the last school will have been established and the game will be over. What does um, the school do? Well, to understand that, we have to look at what the artist's special ability is. This is the last citizen um, whose special ability I will be explaining. An artist costs uh, zeal plus wisdom. Aristophanes would be a brilliant artist because he has a zeal of one and wisdom of two. So that's the best kind of artist you can have, one that costs three to activate his special ability. What is his special ability? His special ability, and you can see I had to change, this is not uh, the proper tableau, so I had to change the rules a little bit um, with a with marker. But the ability is that you can move one of your tokens X spaces. X equals the amount of schools that you've established, plus, and this symbol right here, is this is the one that I had to add, and I don't think that it's even focusing anyway, so I'm sorry that this is probably very difficult to see right now. X equals schools times Greek-speaking cities. So, um, when you have a city that is on one of these light brown territories, there are some dark brown territories here on the edge, and then there are some light brown territories, and that's most of the territories in the middle of the map. And when you have a city on one of those light brown territories, Thebes, Boeotia, Thessaly, Laconia, Argos, and also, um, and also you've got Syracuse is a light brown territory, and then uh, you also have uh, Miletus is also light brown. So if you have a city on one of those territories, then it's a Greek city. And when you want to expand cultural influence, it's good to have presence in the Greek-speaking world. So Argos, in this scenario right now, has three Greek-speaking cities. So, when you use a special ability to activate your artist, um, you, have, you flip your artist, you spend three or four coins, depending on how skillful he is, and then you count up how many schools you have and you count up how many Greek cities you have. Well, last turn I activated my philosopher to establish a school. So I have one, one school, and I have three Greek-speaking cities. One times three is three. But if I had more schools, let's say I had three schools, because I had activated my philosopher three times, and I have three Greek-speaking cities. Well, that's nine. All of a sudden, I can spend a couple of coins and activate my artist to move one of my culture tokens nine spaces. Look at this. If I'm Argos, and I have three schools, and I have three Greek cities, I activate my artist, and I spend four coins. And I go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. And now I'm by far the most influential, culturally influential faction in the game. If I had just one more school, I could move one of my culture tokens 12 spaces. And if I had just one more Greek, Greek city and one more school, I could move it 16 spaces, four times four. If I had eight Greek-speaking cities and eight schools, then that would be moving one of my culture tokens 64 spaces, meaning I would win the game immediately because I would encompass the entire culture wheel. So um, you want to be using your philosophers and your artists a lot because that's what's going to win you the game. But the problem is that, first of all, they're only useful if you have a significant presence in the Greek-speaking world. If you only have one or two cities on Greek uh, territories, that's going to be a disadvantage. So Persia has to be militarily aggressive if they want to have a chance of winning this game, uh, because they don't have any uh, Greek cities at the beginning of the game. And, um, and the other thing is that you need to have a, quite a powerful economy to be able to support your philosophers and artists, because they're very expensive. So, um, first you have to buy them, then you have to pay to sustain them, and then you have to pay. Paying to activate artists costs three or four coins, um, 
that's that's quite a bit. Uh, if you want to, if you have multiple artists, if you have three artists, then uh, activating all of them is going to cost at least 10 coins per round. So even towards the end of the game, you're probably not going to be able to do that um, unless you have a very good economy. So um, so that's how you win the game, by um, having a powerful economy, which is able to support your military and your cultural influence. And then you want to also have a powerful military so that you can defend your Greek cities so that you and your economy, your trade routes and so on. And then mostly you're going to want to be, towards the end of the game, putting everything into cultural influence so that you can have uh, a greater portion of control, a greater portion of the culture wheel than any other player. Uh, so we've got six types of citizens. So, uh, demagogues generate coin and speed up um, the speed of play because they allow you to perform multiple actions simultaneously. Statesmen um, flip your city cards so that you can activate them again later on in the round, which is very powerful. Generals move on land and they fight on land as well, but but um, but when you activate them, then they either you can either move them for free on land or even sea territories if you occupy the sea territory, or you can sp spend extra to move them faster on land, but only on land. And admirals are the opposite; they can move for free on land uh, on sea, sometimes on land, but you can also pay extra to move them quicker on sea. And then philosophers and artists both move culture tokens, but their special abilities the special ability of the philosopher generates or establishes schools. And the special ability of the artist to uses the schools and the amount of territory that you have in the Greek-speaking world to expand your cultural influence to a greater de degree than anything else in the game. So um, that's citizens. Each citizen, uh, once they're appointed, they stay there for life, and then um, for the rest of the game, then you're going to be using that citizen either every round. You're either going to use his free ability or his paid ability. Now let's talk about combat. So. Um, Combat begins when a player, on their turn, activates a city and says, I'm attacking you here, and then they point to a territory that they share with another player. They might share that territory with multiple players. Maybe uh, it's just two people there, or you could have every single player, theoretically, could have their general in one territory, and then if somebody initiates combat there, the battle begins. Each battle is going to have three phases. There's going to be the phase of choosing sides, um, inflicting casualties, and capturing. Those are the three phases in um, the the uh, in, in combat. First, choosing sides. Each phase is going to start with the attacking player, the player who, in, who initiated combat, and when they're choosing sides, then they're going to choose one player that's present in that territory who's going to be the defender. And so let's say Athens is attacking Argos in Laconia. And so Athens is the attacker, and in choosing sides in that first phase, they say, I'm attacking the Argive player. And so Athens is now the attacker, Argos is the defender. If anybody else is present in that territory, then we go clockwise around the culture wheel, starting from the attacking player, and each player decides which side they want to join. Do they want to join the attacker side or the defender side? So at the, begin at the end of the first phase, we know exactly who is fighting against whom. There are going to be two sides to this combat. There's going to be an attacking side and a defending side. If there are just two people present, it's very simple. The attacker attacks the whoever else is in that territory. If there are multiple people, then they have to choose which side they're going to join. You can't remain neutral. So uh, also, another thing that you're going to do in this uh, phase is you're going to figure out exactly which uh, of your units are going to be participating about. So if it's a land territory, um, then if you have a city present or a general present, they are going to be participating about. Basically, any units that you have, any cards that you have with figures in that territory are going to be participating about whether they like it or not. And you're going to lay out all of the cards that belong to those pieces um, so that everybody can see exactly what the forces of each player are that are participating in the battle. So um, cities and generals and walls and all military units that belong to generals are going to participate in every land battle um, in the territory that they occupy. And trade routes and admirals and all military units that belong to that admiral are going to participate in battle at any uh, sea ter ter territory which they occupy. If you have a general at sea, then he is going to be, you're going to put him to the side and all of his military units to the side. And they can be lost as casualties later on but they're not going to be able to fight in the battle. So they're just going to be there, and they're just going to be cheering for their soldiers, because if you lose a battle, um, and everybody, all of your units are wiped out, then you also lose the general and everybody, because they drown, basically. They, they're, on, they're on a bunch of ships, and the ships were destroyed, so all the, the, your army drowns. And the same goes for admirals when they're on land. Admirals on land don't fight, but they are susceptible to being destroyed, because they're docked in the port, and the port is set on fire, or the, the ships are destroyed. So. Um, so you want to be careful with moving admirals across land and generals across sea, because if somebody attacks you there and destroys you, then everybody dies. Um, okay, so that's phase one, choosing sides. Now we know exactly who's participating in combat. Let's say if I have a, a city with two walls, 
then I'm going to put those three cards out so everybody can see that that's who's participating. Meanwhile, the the person who's attacking me, let's say they have a general and four military units, so they put those five cards out and we know exactly who's attacking. Now, from now on, I'm not going to be talking about these as cards, but as units. So I have three units participating in this combat. One city and two walls. My opponent has five units participating in combat. A general and four military units. So it's, it's three against five. So that's choosing sides. Second, inflicting casualties. Again, starting from the attacking player going clockwise around the culture wheel, each player is going to draw cards from their battle deck. And the number of cards that they draw from the battle deck is equal to the amount of units that they have in the battle. So I'm being attacked by a general with four military units. That's five units in total. They're going to draw five cards from the battle deck, their battle deck. If they haven't invested in military tradition, then the best that they can hope for is three hits. As soon as they've revealed what cards they have, then um, they hit me as the, def uh, the defender. They get to choose um, which of the defenders they're going to target if there are multiple defenders. So if it's like two against two, for example, then one of the attackers reveals three hit points. They get to inflict casualties to whom they decide. So they could focus them all in on one uh, target, or they could distribute them and say, I'm attacking you with two and you with one hit. Um, but if it's just a one-on-one -on -one fight, then okay, I just have to receive three um, three hits, three casualties, if that's what they drew from their battle deck. Now, unfortunately, I only have three units present, so I have to lose both of my walls and my city. Each unit can, can, can satisfy one casualty. So, uh, when you're drawing from your battle deck, you're going to want to hope that you get hits and um, military tradition, because that's what's going to cause casualties to the enemy. So he just hit me with three, but I had three units at the beginning of the battle, so I get to use, uh, so I get to draw three battle cards and see what I hit with him. Let's say I get two misses in a military tradition. That would be, military tradition is two hits. So then he has to take two casualties. If there were multiple attackers, then I could distribute those hits among uh, each of my opponents. Um, and so we're going to go clockwise from the attacker around the culture wheel. Everybody gets to draw from their battle tech one time. They draw according to they draw a number of cards according to how many units they have participating in the battle. Everybody, that means everybody who has territorial presence in the specific territory, plus the military units um, belonging to a general if it's a land territory, military units belonging to an admiral if it's a sea territory. And at the end of this phase, we've got two little piles of casualties, um, a pile of attacking casualties and a, and a pile of defending casualties. And that's going to be important for uh, phase three, which is capturing. So uh, again, phase three begins with the attacking player, and then we move clockwise around the culture wheel, and each person has one chance, uh, or not just one chance, but has the opportunity to capture a card from the enemy casualty pile. So um, my attacker, who, um, who destroyed my city and two walls, is going to look at those three cards and is going to decide if he wants to capture one of them. Uh, if he could capture my city, that would be particularly useful. Um, but the, the problem is that capturing costs two coins, no matter what card you're capturing. So a military unit costs two coins and so does a city. So some, some cards are always worth capturing, some cards are almost never worth capturing. So, but he's looking at two walls and a city. And he looks at how many coins he has and he's got three coins left. That means he can capture one co co card of the, of the ones that he's destroyed. And so that's an easy choice. He pays those two coins to the stock, not to me as the defender, but to the stock. And he gets the city card. He says, I'm capturing your city. And so instead of destroying the city, he takes it as his own, and he actually he will then control it. In order to capture a card, you need to be you need to pay two coins. You can capture as many as you want, as long as you can pay for them. Any any card from the casualty pile of your of your opponents. Um, and so if he had six coins, then he could capture my uh, my city and both the walls, and those would be his. And so he would um, that would be quite powerful. Um, but you need to, they need to be. Um, they, they need to be eligible for capture, which means that you can't take military units if you don't have a general present. Or if it's a sea territory, you can't take military units if you don't have an admiral present. You can't capture walls if you don't have a city where that you can put the walls around. Um, and you can't capture a general if you already have three generals. So um, you need to think strategically, or not just strategically, but just logically, about whether, according to the rules, you're actually able to take that card. Because you can't, it's not always the case that you can. So you need to be able to pay for it and it needs to be eligible. But otherwise you can capture anything you want. Um, and then we go clockwise around and everybody um, has an opportunity to look through their enemy's uh, casualty pile and maybe capture a card or two. Oh, and the, another another requirement for that to be eligible is that you have to have presence left in that territory. Oh, and I'm sorry, this is one more very important detail. If you don't have presence left in the territory, um, then you lose your general at sea and or you lose your admiral on land. So if I have a city with one wall, and, there, and, and an admiral who's docked at the city, and I lose my city and my wall, then I also lose my ad, admiral and all of those military units, and then my enemy could 
capture my admiral or capture those military units as, as if they were normal casualties. So combat uh, consists of three phases, choosing sides, which is usually really simple and very straightforward. Um, but during that time, you're also going to be showing everybody exactly who's going to be participating in combat. And the answer to the question who's going to be participating in combat is everybody who has physical presence in that territory, including military units who are connected to a general or to an admiral. Second, we are going to inflict casualties. We go one at a time, starting with the attacking player, going around in a circle, everybody draws from their battle deck, counts how many hits they are, and distributes those hits to the enemies. Then the, the enemies whom you're inflicting those casualties on then um, choose which cards they want to lose. So obviously you're going to lose your less valuable cards before you have to lose your more valuable cards. After everybody has had the opportunity to inflict casualties one time, then we move on to capturing. And anybody who has money can capture a card in the enemy's uh, casualty pile. Everybody has one chance to hit their enemy with their battle deck. Everybody has one chance to capture and then combat is over. So it's possible that you'll still have two big armies in the same territory at the end of combat. It's not guaranteed that one of the armies will completely destroy the other one. Maybe it will require multiple battles to actually uh, destroy your enemy in a given territory. Uh, but you can use another city next turn to initiate combat again in that same territory if your enemy is still present though. So that's how combat works. Um, and technically, those are all of the rules of the game, and you know everything that you need to know. But I'm just going to give a summary of everything, just a big picture of, of what this game is all about. So, the goal of the game is to dominate Greek culture. If you can succeed in dominating the entire culture wheel, you win the game immediately. But more likely is that you're going to be struggling a little bit more, and you want to be the player who has the most cultural influence when all schools have been established and the game ends. Now, as soon as the last school has been established, the game doesn't end until the end of the round, so you still have time to do whatever it is that you need to do um, to have a greater cultural influence than your opponents. Um, but the way that you're going to get that cultural influence is by having presence in the Greek-speaking world. And the way that you do that is by having uh, cities on light brown territories. The problem with having cities on light brown territories is that somebody can come and can attack it with their general. And if they do that, they can take it from you, and then you won't be able to expand your culture anymore. And so uh, you want to have some kind of a military that will be able to defend. Or maybe if you're the Persian player, you're going to have to have some kind of military so that you can attack other players and take their Greek cities. Um, you're also going to want to have a bunch of schools because the schools have a multiplying effect on the effectivity of your Greek-speaking territory when you're using an artist. So you want to have a lot of schools, you want to have a lot of Greek cities, but even if you have both of those things, it's going to be very expensive to be, keep paying your artists and also your philosophers, and so you're going to want to have a powerful economy. So by the end of this game, you're going to have to be investing at least a little bit in your economy, in your military, and in the culture, um, because if you're lacking in one of those areas, then it's going to be very difficult to sustain the momentum towards the end of the game and be expanding your cultural influence the way that you want to. Now, a couple of other things that you're going to want to watch out for. Um, cultural advantages. You can steal cultural advantages from other players and make cards cheaper for you, and that can be an enormous, uh, a powerful advantage. You want to watch out for if somebody else is expanding their cultural influence, uh, because that's the person who's going to win the game, unless you stop them. And sometimes the only way to stop them is militarily, so you need to be thinking about that as well. Um, one cultural advantage that might be a little bit difficult to understand is the Persian advantage of capturing. And what that is is that when Persia is fighting, they don't have to spend two coins to capture one card, but just one coin to capture a card, which is an extremely powerful cultural advantage, and, it, and that should encourage the uh, person player to be militarily active. And um, so another thing that you're going to want to think about, other than economy, military, and culture, is uh, diplomacy. You want to have good relationships with the people around you. Um, sometimes you can get into very difficult situations, and you might feel like there's no way for you to possibly win. Um, and it would be good to remember that those are the moments when you need to have good relationships with other people on the board. Uh, because if you can gang up with on gang up with somebody against a more culturally advanced society, uh, a faction, then that could save you. And unexpected things can happen if you have good relationships with people who are around you. If you have bad relationships, then expect them to gang up on you and destroy you and take all the things that you thought were very secure. Um, and then another extremely important aspect of this game is timing. You need to never um, underestimate the speed of the game towards the end. Um, nine schools could easily be established in a single round. You might feel like, oh no, the end is very far away, but it could be just around the corner. And the fact of the matter is that you might have the greatest economy and the greatest military, but if you don't have philosophers, you're going to have to get those philosophers. You might have the money to obtain them, but you're going to buy those philosophers. You can't use them until the next round. So the next round comes along and you activate your philosophers. Now you have schools, that's great, but now you need to have artists who are able to use those schools um, so that you can expand your cultural influence. But, oh, it's too late because somebody just bought the last school and the game is over. And, and so you need to be constantly thinking about, I'm running out of time to actually gain this cultural influence that, that I wanted to. And so you're going to have to balance 
a lot of different factors and sometimes it's foolish to act too soon. Sometimes it's foolish to wait too long because you might not have the, t the time to execute this grand plan that would take seven rounds. Maybe you only have three rounds left. So uh, this is especially important for the uh, Persian player. Just remember, for the you can only with one general, you can only capture at most one city from your opponents per turn because you can't. Your general can only be activated once. You can only move to one territory, um, and then you can initiate combat there and you can take somebody's city. But you're not going to be taking four or five cities in one turn, in one round. That is. So as a Persian player, you need to be thinking ahead and realize that um, if the game is going to end and you don't have Greek cities, it's probably already too late. So you need to be thinking about that before the game is about to end and gradually be gaining Greek territory as the game goes on. Um, so uh, those are some strategic points, but otherwise I think that that is all the rules to the game. I'm sorry that this took such a long time. I, thought, I hope that this tutorial was at least interesting and that it wasn't a waste of your time. But um, I think that you have everything that you need right now to be able to play the game. So I'm probably going to make a couple of example videos to go along with this, um, but that's going to take another long amount of time for me. So for now, this is this is what I'm able to do.